What the Actual Fork podcast is co-hosted by two intuitive eating registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, owner of Fine Food Freedom, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. We can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we are medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest, darkest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So get comfy and join us for a casual convo where you can expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Guys, I am back. This is Jenna. I am finally sitting down during a nap time, drinking my coffee out of my I'm so fucking tired mug to set the tone here for a second. Um, But I have been putting off this podcast for 12 weeks now. Um, I am here to talk about the fourth trimester, and I'm super excited to be connecting with you guys again. I'm going to say this probably twice, but I will probably record this in chunks um, in more than one segment of time because life these days is just really unpredictable. But like I have mentioned on Instagram, Sammy and the girls gave me a deadline and that's how I work best. And so here I am ready to talk to you all things fourth trimester. So first of all, I've missed you. Second of all, I'm super excited to be here. And third, I just want to set the tone and make one thing like very, very clear that I had no idea what the fourth fucking trimester was before getting pregnant and even while being pregnant. Um, And for someone who felt like pregnancy was kind of fun, like looking back on it, like easy kind of for me for the most part, um, the fourth trimester really kicked my ass. And so I would say people say that the third trimester is pretty hard totally like the end of the third trimester you'll hear it in a little bit was rough but the fourth whoo what a doozy doesn't mean anything bad um but yeah okay anyways i'm going to continue on here so this is also a podcast where i will not be giving advice i just want to make that very very clear this is not medical advice this is a podcast that is more about my experience and things that i wish i knew versus wish i didn't know um or and also sharing things that i didn't know i was also of the desire while pregnant to not know a lot of these things. Um, I chose not to do the research. I chose not to read about these things. I chose not to learn. Quincy is still Quincy, if you guys can hear that. Um, I chose not to understand a lot of these things going forward or be prepared for them. And if that's where you are right now, you might want to put this um, episode on pause until you're ready. Do I think that this helped me? Do I think that that was the right choice? I'm not really sure. I'm a first time mom. This was my first experience. I don't know how I would have been or dealt with things if I knew or if I had expected them more. So I really can't give you that expectation or I can't give you that explanation. Um, But I really do in my heart believe that first time moms especially should really enjoy their third trimester as much as possible and not worry about a lot of these things in advance because you really do learn as you go. I do believe that fully. So again, if that's you, if that's where you feel comfortable, maybe press pause save this podcast for later, I will not be offended. And I still like laugh about it that like my nursery was so prepared. Like I can't even say this with a straight face. Like my nursery was so organized. It was legitimately now that I think about it, the only thing that I was prepared for, for postpartum and the postpartum journey. Um, I had no idea that I would need to Instacart boxes and boxes of power pads. That's what I called them. The really thick period pads to my door when the day after getting home from the hospital. But like, don't worry, I had 12 different types of diaper creams that thankfully we still haven't had to use yet. So that should just like, again, really set the tone for you here. Um, I didn't have extra ice packs. I didn't have any of the things ready, but an organized diaper caddy, your girl had that. 
the nesting really kicked in. Like I kicked ass at nesting, but to take care of myself postpartum, it was almost like I had this mental block that like, I didn't realize that it was going to be like a child coming out of a hole. That's like this big, super, super tiny. Cause you can't see me right now. Um, and that has to heal. Like I, I, I must've mentally blocked that out and didn't realize what that recovery would actually be like. But anyways, all of that said, I think that every single human being's birth experience is different. And what I have learned the most is that every women, woman will feel a lot of the same things about their experience, but in very different ways. And so when I think back about those first couple of days and weeks, it's like, did I wish I knew these things? Like, yeah, but would they have actually prepared me? Probably not, right? So it's like this dichotomy, I think is the right word, of emotions of I would have liked to have known and maybe been a little bit more prepared for what was coming my way, but would it have made it any better physically? Probably not but mentally, definitely. So if that's where you are right now, keep listening. <laughs> so again, these are my feelings and experiences that you're going to hear in this episode today. They are unique to me, but my purpose in sharing what I will share today is to maybe normalize some of the feelings that I felt that I know many of you have or may feel and help someone feel less alone. And it's funny. I mean, I will share a piece of my birth story in this episode, but I really appreciated the women who didn't tell me their birth stories because, again, every single birth is different. Every single person's experience is going to be different. And did I need to know any of like the traumatic birth stories going into my own situation? No. Um, and again, mine, I'm not going to share all of it, but if you don't want to hear anybody's birth story, I'm going to warn you in advance that there will be pieces of mine shared. So. Again, these are just your warnings going into it. Um, a lot of this episode, I'm going to be answering questions that you guys have sent in through Instagram. Um, and it's really mostly talking through emotions. So all of that being said, let's dive in. It has been officially 13 weeks since I've slept an eight hour chunk straight. Now I'll backtrack. We're in a very good place right now. Um, a different place right now, sleeping much more. Uh, but I'm coming on this episode after getting my second vaccine shot last night. And I guess maybe it was just my body reacting. I was up all night long. So if I pause, it's to take a big sip of my coffee. This had nothing to do with the baby, thankfully. But anyways, um, I know that the longer chunks of time and like the sleeping through the night will come. But I also have a really small baby that needs nighttime feeding still. These are things I didn't know. I was reading that book like 12 hours by 12 weeks thinking that was like my end goal and I'd be sleeping 12 hours with that baby. That wasn't my reality. Um, maybe it's yours and that is amazing. But anyways, coming at this, backtracking a little bit more. I say 13 weeks and I have a 12 week old baby because the week that I was going, the week that Noah was born, I had what was called prodromal labor for four days prior to his arrival. I didn't know what that meant prior to pregnancy and prior to somebody telling me that that's what I was experiencing at the time. Um, but it is essentially that I was laboring at home on and off for four full days prior to him actually entering this world. Um, and it's funny because I really didn't even know that like, I, I, I didn't really have a lot of Braxton Hicks contractions during pregnancy. And people would say like, you'll know when you have a real contraction. And I'd be like, oh, okay. So that must not be it because it was like kind of uncomfortable, but like I was okay. But anyways, I didn't understand that process either until I actually had one. And yeah, it's definitely a different feeling. And when that came on, it was a Thursday night. It's like prodromal label is like this really mean thing where it only happens basically at nighttime. It's almost like your body's like prepping you for the sleepless nights that will come. Um, but essentially it came on Thursday night and I was like, okay, this is different. Now I would talk to people and they'd tell me things like you can do anything for one minute and you want to kill them at first because you're like, fuck you. This is the, the longest 60 seconds of my life. And why is it happening so many times? But 
honest to God, that is the only phrase that got me through those days and the labor itself. Um, again, prodromal labor, labor typically only happens at night. So Noah was born on Sunday and on Thursday night, my contractions started. I think I slept four minutes that Thursday night because I was panicking. Like I wasn't sure what was going on. The next morning though, 7 a.m., Friday morning, like clockwork, they were gone. But then Friday night and Saturday night and Sunday morning, they were nonstop. So Saturday night, I remember it started at like 4 p.m. I remember sitting on an exercise ball. My parents were at my house and I was like bent over in pain. And I was like, they're starting again. But the doctor says it could be weeks of this, like didn't think anything of it. But then I was up all night timing my contractions. Um, Saturday night, I slept in the guest room because I wanted my husband to sleep. Um, and Quincy was with me. And then Sunday morning, they just kept going and I was a disaster. Saturday, I actually called the doctor and he told me to take a Benadryl to sleep, whatever. Um, and I, I was awake through the Benadryl. So I had that like medication high on top of exhaustion and then the contractions kept going. Anyways, um, Sunday we spoke with our doula and she was like, Jenna, you're in labor. Call your doctor again, make a plan, you know, go from here. She was absolutely amazing. I shit you not, I had contractions. When the doctor said, just come to the hospital, bring your stuff, we'll see what's going on. I had contractions the entire one hour drive to the hospital, four minutes apart, three minutes apart, five minutes apart. Like they were on, like they were exactly what labor is supposed to be, quote unquote. And the fucking second I arrived and they hooked me up to the monitors in the triage room, my contractions stopped. Like stopped like moment of silence really think about that for a second this was four days and now I'm finally at this hospital like ready mentally you know we had done all the things on Sunday I took a bath I took a walk I was eating dates drinking tea like fueling my body up for this marathon I knew was going to be ahead and they were like "Ooh, you're not in labor anymore and I looked at my husband, I swear to you, I was like possessed at that moment. And I was like, I am not leaving this hospital without my baby. <laughs> like, I think that put a sense of fear inside him as well. And we, the, essentially the team gave us like a couple hours. Like I remember them saying those words, like, we'll give you a couple hours and see if you dilate. And I looked at these people and I was like, give me a couple out. I am in so much pain. Like I can't even describe it to you. But anyways, I will spare you all of those details. I eventually within that time frame that they quote unquote gave me was admitted. Um, and within a few hours after that, Noah was here. Labor was not flawless. There is no such thing as a flawless labor. And mine certainly was not, um, but Noah is healthy and he's here and that is what matters. So for those of you who have followed along this entire time, you know my husband was also positive that this child that was growing in me was a girl. So when a little boy popped out, there was literally like a pause when the doctor said, so dad, what is it? And he like paused. And I was like, oh my God, it's definitely a boy. Um, but that was like such a, a hysterical moment for us that came with some comic relief that we all needed in those post laboring moments and then the surge of the most joy that I think I've ever felt in my life. And I think that people say that. I also will tell you later on in this episode too, that I don't, in so many words, I don't think that my mom instincts like kicked in right away. And that was something that, because you see that on social media all the time, that like, it's an instant like connection and it's this instant everything. And, you know, I thought there was something wrong with me because that didn't kick on right away, especially when they asked me to change a diaper and I didn't know how. Um, but that moment when he was laying on me, I just, all I remember is being like, we did it. Like we've been through, me and this baby have been through something that only me and this baby will experience. And I'm gonna start crying because I'm definitely still hormonal. Um, and it's a really special and in crazy, in crazy, it's a really special and amazing feeling that 
I think makes some of the hardships so much easier. I think that the labor delivery birth postpartum fourth trimester process has a lot of little nuggets that keep you going. I mean, the reality is, is that people say you forget labor, you forget the first month, you forget the first weeks, you forget a lot of these things to like their fullest potential because that's why women have more babies if they're able to. Because if you didn't, I don't know that I would. Um, I'm just kidding. I mean, not really kidding, actually. I'm being honest with you guys. That's all I know how to do. Um, it's not, it wasn't easy for me. And I'm not ashamed to say that. And I've shared that on Instagram as well, that I don't think it makes me less of a mom or less of a great mom to say that this is hard. These past three months have been really, really hard for me. But, um, all of that said, I need to also everyone here to know that when they woke me up at four o'clock in the morning that night, so Noah was born at 8.30 p.m., um, four o'clock in the morning, the next morning when like the nurse was about to leave, I believe it was around that time. Um, and she said, you know, have you peed yet? And I was like, no. And then she was like, have you changed the baby's diaper yet? And I was like, mm, no. And she's like, okay, like, let's do both before I leave. And I'm like, okay. And so like, sh it took all her strength for, to get me out of bed for me to like go to the bathroom and see my post laborness everywhere um, for the first time ever with the bleeding and I was wearing this huge diaper and ice pack and all the things and like starting to get feeling back in my legs because I did have an epidural. Um, but it was like 15 minutes for me to pee, right? And then she detached me from my IV at that moment. And I was like, okay, change the baby's diaper. And I'm like, wait, you're not going to do that for me? Like that was me as a first time mom. And Matt was sleeping, not sleeping. He was on like the little couch bed area and was like, I don't know how to change the diaper either. And we were like, can you just show us? And so like, I just need you to know, like I had never changed a diaper before. Prior to having Noah, I was sleeping while pregnant 10 hours every night while pregnant. And I am a self-proclaimed selfish type A human being and my life changed in that moment so fast. Like I've said before, I think it's a beautiful, welcomed, happy, amazing change, but it's still a really hard adjustment. And again, like these two differing emotions are allowed to live in my brain at the same time. It doesn't make me any less of a person. It doesn't make you any less of a person. If you feel these things too, if you feel happy and sad or frustrated and content, like all of these things, I needed somebody to tell me that. And so if you need somebody to tell you that, this is me telling you that. Like these things were swirling through my brain at the same time. It was, oh my God, I'm never going to sleep again. And oh my God, I love this human being so much. And oh my God, I'm freaking out. Oh my God, this is the best. Like these things were happening. So as I have said before, before we got into the postpartum state, I literally need you to understand that I remember very little about my first month. Um, because this is my body's way of protecting me. Like that's what I believe to be true. Um, but I do remember that first night and I will never ever forget that first night. Thankfully of being a first time mom, I'll never have to re-experience that first night. But I just remember my husband and I, when we finally were home, the bassinet's right next to the bed and we're exhausted, right? And the kid was silent in the hospital. Like he slept he slept silently. Like, I know this is normal now, but we get home and it was like we woke up a gremlin dinosaur and not a baby anymore. He made the loudest noises to come out of a tiny human I've ever heard in my entire life. My husband and I were terrified. We took turns just staring at the bassinet. We we're like, what is happening? Come to find out that these are just newborn noises. And like the phrase sleep like a baby isn't a real thing. And now I've seen the memes on Instagram, but like, where were those memes when I was pregnant. Instagram protected me from knowing these things because I swear to you, every mom posts the same things, but I didn't see it. <laughs> um, and I think that that is also something that is hysterical. So if you are about to give birth and your child makes crazy noises in the middle of the night, you're not alone. I think my nap time window is coming to a close, so I might be taking a pause and coming back to you very soon. But what I want to continue to talk about here is what I was really not prepared for. So I think the mom stuff, the baby stuff, people can help you with that, right? But what I was not ready for 
was the physical healing and the mental healing. And I remember having a very distinct conversation with my mom. We were on a walk. She was walking Quincy. I was walking with the stroller. And that was really hard for me too, physically, but also mentally because Quincy and I's relationship took a really tough, had a really tough beginning. Um, it's, it's still been a little rocky, but we're in a better place now. But when I couldn't walk him, it was really hard for both of us. But um, I remember having a conversation with my mom that I talk about these five pillars of health with all of my clients. Lauren, Danielle, and I talk about these five pillars of health and everything that we do at HSH and what we call them or what these pillars are is nutrition, sleep, stress management, movement, hydration. We tell people often, if you can't give your all to all of them, pick three and really focus so hard on them and give them your all so that your balance doesn't tip over, right? Because three out of five, you're, you're in the, uh, the advantage. And so when I'm trying to heal my body and take care of a baby, I could only give myself to one of those pillars. I was only allowed to dedicate myself to one of those pillars. And that was hydration. Because let me just tell you, you have to hydrate hard. You've never felt thirst like you have postpartum. Um, and there was like, I was giving my all to my hydration. I was doing the best that I could, but those other pillars were taking a huge beating. And as a dietitian, as a human, I'm just sitting here thinking like, how will this ever get better if I can't take care of myself? And then I had this like mental spiral of, oh my God, how many times have I told women to like really make, take care of themselves as new moms? And I'm sitting here like, wow, Jenna, you're such an asshole <laughs> because hearing that, like, you know, you want to be doing these things, but it's really, really, hard. Um, even with the support and help that I have, and I'm very blessed to have my parents close by and a husband who is so supportive, but learning to breastfeed, taking care of a newborn who is terrified because he doesn't know where the fuck he is. All he knows is the inside of my body. And what I've learned is that in that fourth trimester, all he wants to do is everything in his power to get back into my body. Um, and he's scared and I'm bleeding and I'm leaking and I'm sweating and I'm hormonal and there's just no ability. There was no, for me, no ability to do anything else than survive. And so what I did was I hydrated really, really hard. And I found ways to sneak in pieces of those other pillars wherever I could. For example, food. Here is a tip I can share with you. I kept snacks in the bathroom and in the nursery at my breastfeeding station or wherever I would breastfeed around the house. In those first weeks, I would just keep snacks there. Like I literally would suck down peanut butter packets on top of protein bars and dried fruits in the bathroom while I was right before I was brushing my teeth or right after. Um, dentists are probably like, oh my God, panicking right now. But I would have them there because that was like the minutes that I had before the baby would wake up or while he was being taken care of that I could get some nourishment in me before a meal was possible or before I had to breastfeed again or whatever the case was. Getting downstairs physically was hard and, you know, just timing wise, everything is just so much more challenging or it really was for me. Um, Matt would make me meals that I could eat with one hand because I was constantly holding the baby and I needed to eat so much more to stay awake and also to produce milk. Like there's a lot of pressure to produce milk. And what I learned is that my stress and I was so stressed about the baby gaining weight and, you know, was my milk enough? Is he satisfied? Is he okay? All the things swirling in my head. I was actually told that my cortisol level was probably through the roof, that stress management that I wasn't taking care of. And it was actually negatively impacting my milk supply, which again, I should know these things, but in those moments, you don't know anything. At least I didn't. Um, so again, just doing what you can to take care of what you can for yourself is enough, is my point. Now, as a dietitian, I know the importance of nutrition and healing, and I know the importance of stress management and healing. And when I say healing, every single person's procedure for birth is going to be different. Um, I had some healing to do, and it was not a C-section, but I had stitches and, you know, again, without giving too many details away, there is physical healing, no matter what your birth story is that needs to happen. And it requires rest. 
aka sleep and nutrition and hydration and stress management and all the things. And for me, those it was very, very difficult to wrap my head around that in the beginning. But what I need you guys to know is it gets easier. It really does. But in those dark moments for me, I felt like, why wasn't I more prepared for this? And why is this just so hard for me? Like, is this me? I kept going to this dark spirally place. And I know that's hormonally related. But if you are a new mom in this phase, please know that your feelings are normal. They're valid. You're not alone in feeling them. And please do what you can to get help, but also know that what you can do to support any of those pillars is enough and it will get better and it will get easier. Um, that was really hard for me. And it was those middle of the night conversations talking to new moms where they were telling me they felt the same things or were feeling the same things that really got me through. So if I can give that back to somebody else, that is what I feel my duty is. Um, the other thing that really surprised me in those first couple of nights was the night sweats, like going back to hydration, like holy hell, that first night morning, I woke up in a puddle of breast. I don't think my sheets or my uh, mattress is ever going to be the same, but I woke up in a puddle of breast milk and sweat together. I thought I broke a fever. I didn't know what was happening to me. I didn't know night sweats were real, but they are. Everybody talks about them now. I didn't know that. Um, my body was like, I like just the smell, like the smell of the sweat and breast milk mixed together. Like when I woke up that morning, I was like, something's wrong. Um, it was just no matter how many showers I took, which let's be honest, were very few. I just couldn't get that stench away. <laughs> And like on these same lines, I love how in pregnancy you go from being like this glowy, magical unicorn who everybody just wants to love and take care of and touch your belly and like see you and dote on you and postpartum, like within minutes, I swear to you because of all of the sweat, I felt like my hair was falling out the first day home. You, I've never been more exhausted. My doctor's appointments just stopped. Everybody's appointments just stopped, even though you just had massive surgery essentially and popped the child out of you. Um, and worry every single day about the stitches popping and all of those things. Like the doctor's appointments move very quickly over to just the baby, no longer postpartum care, um, no longer care for you. And oh wait, I like can't go on any further without talking about my fear every day of my first postpartum poop. Sorry for family that's listening to this, but like I cried the entire time leading up to it when I knew it was about to happen. I cried the entire time during, I don't care if it's TMI because everybody needs to to know that if you cry leading up to it, it's okay. Also, like the only reason I knew about a postpartum poop being so scary was from the TV show Working Moms, because again, I feel like this is something nobody wants to talk about for good reason. It's terrible, but like, it's okay. It will get easier. It, it's only the first one. You'll be okay afterwards. There's just like this trauma fear, I think, around it. And for at least there was for me. And it gets better. I promise. Um, but again, it's scary. It's all scary. But after that, like first experience, it does get better. Um, but anyways, like you have all these doctor's appointments every single week leading up to the baby being here. And then it's like all of a sudden snap your fingers. Sure. I'll wait six weeks for medical attention and continue to numb my underwear, sit on ice packs and a donut all day, deal with my cracked nipples. And oh yeah, take care of a new child. No problem. Don't worry about me. It's like, literally you go from being this like pregnant goddess. That's how I felt for moments in my pregnancy to like a hot train wreck. And by hot, I only mean sweaty. Just kidding. Um, I'm definitely being dramatic here, but like, I do think that like up and down roller coaster of emotions and like the way that you feel in your body is so real. And again, it was just something I wasn't prepared for. And so my purpose of sharing this is to help you maybe just expect it more. Or if you felt these things, know that you're not alone. Okay, moving on. I want to address mental health a little more before we move into body image and beyond and wrap up this episode without it being 14 hours long because you can clearly tell I'm passionate about this and have a lot to say and cover. Um, but I want you all to know that no matter what you see on Instagram from a postpartum mother, the newborn weeks are really hard. Um, I cried to my husband and my mom every day. 
every single day. I cried that I felt like I didn't have a maternal instinct, like I mentioned before, or that it didn't kick in fast enough. I cried because I couldn't get onesies on my baby's head. I cried because I couldn't figure out diapers without leaking. I cried because breastfeeding was a really big challenge for me. Side note, it still is. Um, I want to normalize too that I am actually using a nipple shield to continue to help and it's been working. So I'm not trying to wean myself off of it. Um, I know that I could, but it's easier for both of us to use this. And at this point, easy is the best thing for both of us. Um, but I saw all these posts of these women weaning themselves off and talking about why, and it made me feel like shit. Um, and so I unfollowed. <laughs> um, anyways, I've cried because I was so tired. I cried because I didn't know how I could possibly go on being so tired. I cried because my relationship with my husband was changing. I cried because everything hurt. I cried because I didn't, I couldn't imagine the possibility of healing if all I do is cry. And although I've never loved someone or something as much or as deeply as I love little baby Noah, I just didn't feel like me. And I think that's a lot of things to grieve all at once. And I need you to know that it's okay to grieve these things and you're still a good mom and you can still be obsessed with your baby and you can still grieve the life that was couple days ago, right? Um, and I think that these are things that, again, I didn't feel like it was normal for me to feel. But then I talked to other moms and moms going through it at that same time and realized how much we were all feeling the exact same way, which is what inspired me to have this conversation with you all, all of you, anyone who's listening. And I also need you to know it does get better. Um, talking to new moms at all hours of the day and night, like I mentioned before, helped me tremendously. Talking to any mom at all hours of the day and night is beyond inspirational and helpful. And having a friend who simply just says, are you okay? I'm checking in on you, like Sammy, my co-host, did for me my entire time is the greatest gift, um, like the absolute greatest gift. And this is the hardest job that I've ever had. And my brain, my brain, which thrives off of schedules and routines and checklists and getting things done and being active and, you know, doing things all the time went to some really dark places, especially on days that I couldn't get off the couch because of cluster feeding or pain or both days where Noah would only sleep on me. And I was literally stuck on the couch days where Quincy would act out because I wasn't taking care of him. Like I once did these days really sucked and they still do because they do still happen sometimes. And I know that they always will hurt on, to some level, but expectations for me at this point in my life have shifted. And I have, like I've mentioned before, I'm understanding that it, it may not get easier. We just get stronger and more flexible and more able to deal with the new things that are being tossed our way. And that's also something that I wasn't really sure how to manage and, you know, deal with or understand that that was normal before. And I remember talking to my mom one day and she like, had because she'd come over and she'd love when Noah she still loves when Noah sleeps on her and I still love when Noah sleeps on me but in the beginning weeks it was like every 45 minutes he was falling asleep on me and you know I'm just not getting off the couch and she said something to me like you know I get it now that you know it's a beautiful thing for him to sleep on you but then you're literally stuck doing nothing else and that's really hard and I was like thank you for saying that like thank you for recognizing that it's not because I don't love this feeling I do but it's like the dishes the laundry my work you know checking in with my team taking care of myself once I'm able to exercise, to exercise, to walk Quincy, to cook, to do, to feed myself. Any of those things really couldn't happen when there was no, nothing, when there was only a baby on top of me is really what I'm trying to get at. So again, just normalizing and just putting it out there that it is really hard, um, but it's also beautiful and it's okay, again, to have both of those things. But I also just want to mention that if you are feeling lonely, if you are having thoughts that you can't shake, please, please, please ask for help. It took me way too long to ask for the help that I needed. And I want you to empower, I want to empower you to not be like me. 
and to not do that, to ask for help early and often, to let people know how to help you. That was a big one for me. That was a big disconnect for my husband and I when he would say, I want to help. And I'd be like, I don't know what you can do that's not feeding the baby. And, you know, that was really hard for me. But in hindsight, there's a many, many things that I could have verbalized to him much clearer than I did of how and ways that he could help me. Um, but so that's a big one. It makes all the difference in the world to have that support from anyone near or far. And I want to just mention that postpartum depression and anxiety are very, very real. Even if you don't feel like you have it, but you feel sad or you have these thoughts or anxieties or emotions, there are places and spaces to get help. You can please talk to somebody, seek out resources and speak to your doctor, your physician, your OB, all of the resources that are available for you and get that help that you need because sometimes even just a conversation can make all the difference in the world. Um, okay, so I want to move into body image and fitness. And I'm not going to lie to you, this is like a, an odd conversation for me as well, especially those of you that know as, or have listened to my fitness episode. I absolutely loved the six weeks that I wasn't allowed to exercise. I'm sure you weren't expecting to hear that, but I feel like the time that I did have to myself during the day in those six weeks before I was quote unquote cleared, and I'm not even going to talk about that postpartum appointment because I think it's such crap, but anyways, um, those six weeks that I had any time to myself during the day, I had no expectations of what I was going to do with it. There was no, like, I really want to exercise. I really want to take this class. I really want to do 20 minutes on the bike, like whatever it is. Like there was no expectation. So if I did anything, if I walked, if I did laundry, if I showered, if I washed my hair, you know, that was like such a win. And then when I was cleared to move, I won't lie to you. I had this tinge of anxiety of how the fuck was I going to fit this into my day? And the days that I didn't, I was angry and I know now that this was my disordered habits coming back into my life. It wasn't to get my body back. It wasn't, you know, to lose po uh, pregnancy, whatever, but it was this very overwhelming feeling like I had to do it because I could. Um, and again, I'm being honest. I'm not giving advice. This is how I felt, but I knew this wasn't helpful. And I've spent time and energy redirecting this energy and recognizing, again, this is my old disorder creeping back. I'm proud of myself that I was able to recognize what Brie, Body Image with Brie, calls those gremlin thoughts, my thoughts popping into my head of you have to versus you have the ability to and the why behind that. And I want to share this with you to let you know that on your journey, no matter where you are, sometimes, and whatever journey it is, sometimes these thoughts will come back and that's okay. And it's just all about how you handle them and address them and not ignore them, but honor and redirect. And so for me, I spoke with one of my girlfriends, I hope she's listening to this, and she made a comment to me like, I'm the, I want to find ways to move whenever days that I can, but I've gotten to a space where I know that if it doesn't happen, it's okay. And it's not going to ruin or take away the rest of my day. Um, and I think for me, exercise has always just been such a part of my life and such like a, a mental health aspect. It's not my only coping mechanism, but it's definitely one of them. Um, and when I had the opportunity to do it, and I'm very privileged to have the ability to work out at home, you know, knowing it's right there, but I couldn't even get 15 minutes to myself is hard. Um, and I think that was really tough for me, but the exercise makes me feel more like me again too. It makes me feel happy and strong and makes me a better mom when I can have those endorphins swirling around so that when I get to do that, it's like a dream. But what I need to recognize and what I've taught myself to recognize that it's not a, a routine activity at this moment in my life and that's okay. Um, but this ties right into the body image conversation postpartum that so many of you asked about on my little question box. Um, and I need you guys to know that you are allowed to go through any time that you need adjusting to a newborn and a newborn phase and that new normal. And the same applies to your body. It just birthed the human. It just went through trauma. You already know these things. You already know that it 
it gave you the best gift of all. And it does so much for you every single day. There was surgery and organs shifted around and your uterus, like think about this, your uterus actually changed size and did that a couple different times. And side note, I remember in the beginning of the breastfeeding journey for me, I could actually feel my uterus contracting and getting smaller like after birth. And it made me so nauseous. And then I come to learn that I thought I had the flu, by the way, but I come to learn that it's normal and that um, if you are experiencing this, you could be a little bit dehydrated because it's a lot more apparent and you could feel it a lot more when you're not well hydrated. Um, and so I was like, my doula told us that and I was chugging water and electrolytes because of that. But I didn't know that that was normal. I thought there was something literally wrong with me, but my uterus was just going back to size. Like it's wild. Um, anyways, um, you're healing, you're adjusting, there's a whole new life and you're likely like wearing a diaper for many weeks and large pads and an ice pack and things are just different. The body that you knew before carried a baby to term and is a, a different version of of you, but it, it's okay. What I'm trying to say is it's okay if it feels foreign at first. It's okay. If my body felt foreign to me until we got to know each other again. Um, and there's this wild expectation in social media and TikTok and Instagram and all the things make and the what to expect message boards that I read every single night. So many of them are people asking for help about snapping back and getting their body back and all of these things. And there's this horrible expectation on women. And I just need you to know that this is diet culture in just another form, in the worst form. And they're going to try and sell you belly bands and shakes and teas and all of these other bullshit things with an expectation of getting something back that never left and you are vulnerable and you're tired and your hormones are out of fucking control and I understand why some of these might sound appealing to you in those moments but I need you to know and to remember your body just birthed a baby your brain may not see that at all times and you may not feel that at all times but just like diets don't work ever, they really don't. They don't provide happiness. They're not going to work now. These things are not going to provide you happiness post baby either. And honestly, I can't even imagine being calorie restricted on top of trying to maintain my milk supply, on top of trying to maintain my relationship with my husband, on top of trying to shower and take care of myself and eat and give attention to my dog and answer emails and texts and clean the house, then thank you notes and just be a decent human being. Like you get it. MLMs and diet culture, I beg you to leave postpartum women alone. We have enough going on. Okay. Um, I also just want to normalize for you though, again, that it's okay to feel uncomfortable at first, but you need to give your gorgeous body some time. You need to let it heal. You need to let it get back into movement and things that make you feel good and give it time to get there. I posted recently that I sized up in my jeans and it's one of the greatest things that I've ever done. And it was a huge win in my journey because I was trying to make something, I was trying to feel comfortable by wearing clothes that previously made me feel good that don't make me feel good right now and it was making me feel worse and so recognizing that and giving myself the gift of comfort was such a win for me and it can be for you too and just sometimes it just really helps to hear these things um but I could go on about this forever and the, the last thing really that I want to cover quickly and normalize and just touch on because I got a lot of questions on this one as well is how I am feeding my baby um this is something I have not shared yet. And if you're listening to this, you're privy to very private information. But, you know, the first couple of weeks of my baby's life, um, he refused to gain weight, essentially. And it's almost like a cruel joke that I'm an anti-diet dietitian that tells people not to care about the scale. And I was obsessed with weighing my baby for weeks. This ties in deeply to the postpartum depression that I believe I was experiencing because it was <laughs> first... Sorry, baby and dog interruptions still happening. Anyways, in those first few weeks as I was breastfeeding every two hours around the clock and my baby was not gaining like he was supposed to, the only thought going through my mind was that I was a failure. And in my head, this was my one job, my one job that I was dedicating 24 hours of my day to and I was failing. 
And what I can tell you is it was a very dark place and I'm very, very grateful for the support that I had and for the people that helped me find solutions. But again, social media, message boards, you hear things like breast is best. And that just wasn't the case for us. For us, fed was best. And I did start supplementing. And then Noah didn't agree with something that um, either I was eating or the supplement itself. And so I had to cut dairy and sometimes soy and we had to switch the supplement and I was pumping and breastfeeding and supplementing and doing all of these things. And slowly but surely, my little peanut started to gain some weight and it's still happening very slowly, but we're finding a rhythm. And three months in, I'm still finding a rhythm with breastfeeding and feeding my baby. And the only way what I can say, and I want to say this without offending anyone, but you know, that's not possible, but just seriously, fuck anyone that tells you that the only way to feed your baby is one specific way, because the truth of the matter is, is that the best way to feed your baby. The only way to feed your baby is the way that physically and mentally makes both of you happy. We supplement every night, especially when I want my wine, LOL, not every night, but maybe some. Um, we supplement throughout the day as needed, and we've figured out a way that it's best for us. And I've mentioned this in the past, but that nipple shield is something that has that I didn't even know existed. I didn't even know it was an option and it has saved my breastfeeding experience. And so from a recommendation perspective, the only thing I will say is do what you need to do to keep your family happy and healthy. And that's it. And if you do breastfeed, make sure you're eating. Please make sure you're eating enough. Please snack. Please eat lactation cookies. Stay hydrated. Eat extra snacks. Eat uh, the food that makes you feel your absolute best. Like do all of the things because that milk supply is like gold and it's very much dependent on your nutrition and how much you're eating. Um, Lastly, my girl Callie, Woman Up Wellness on Instagram, I saw her post something the other day that hit me so hard and she posted something or it was on her story and she was talking about things to register for that will actually help you in your postpartum days and it was like so amazing. I mean, like I said before, my nursery was in great shape, like I had all the things, but day one home from the hospital, I was Instacarting pads to my house because I didn't have enough and I was bleeding and I didn't expect those things, right? Um, she mentioned things like asking or registering for postpartum care kits, meals, meal gift certificates, food in general, a pelvic floor PT. People ask me about that. I didn't actually use one. I have purchased um, some postpartum fitness type recommendations that give exercises. My husband's helped me with some breathing exercises for pelvic floor, um, but I've not used a pelvic floor PT. However, I've heard amazing things. She mentioned night nanny care or just night nurse in general and, you know, just things that can actually help in those first couple days and weeks instead of, I think her quote was, instead of diaper or um, wipe warmers that you won't use, <laughs> right? Like maybe you will, but I haven't. Uh, but the best thing that you can do for your postpartum friends is send food. Feeding yourself is so hard when there's a baby involved and shout out to my parents for literally feeding us the entire first week that we were home and to Matt for literally stepping in as the chef. He became a food blogger during my postpartum early days and that was incredible. But, um, you know, she had a whole list of things on there and it just really made sense. Like these are things that you'll actually use. The rest of the stuff you can start ordering, you know, as you realize what it is that you need. Um, in hindsight, I think I did a lot of things wrong but I don't regret any of them. I was only going to be a first time mom once. And I think everybody has that first time mom emotional feeling. Um, I realize now so many things and I can honestly say, like I said, in my pregnancy podcast, like you don't know what you don't know. And when you start to go through it, you know, I couldn't have ever imagined the emotions in the fourth trimester and what they would bring for me. I couldn't imagine the heart bursting love that I have for this tiny human or how much time he takes up of my day or the love that I have for my partner, watching him love our tiny human or the pain I felt or the sadness that I felt, the confusion that I felt. I felt all all of these emotions at the exact same time. And I hope you hearing this makes you feel less alone if you are feeling any of these things, any similar feelings at all. You can be so happy and hurting at the same time. 
And I, I just want you to hear that. And I hope that you hearing this makes you feel seen and heard. Um, please don't go through that hurt alone, though. Please ask for help. Please seek help. Please allow help. The phrase strong as a mother has a whole new meaning for me. And to all the moms out there, I see you. I support you. You inspire me. And I love you. And I do want to add in here to the, all the women that are trying to conceive and on their own journeys at this moment. I also see you. I love you. And I'm holding space for you as well. Um, if you guys have any further questions on this topic, I feel like this was like a journal entry for me. It was rambly. It covered so many things, but then you guys only have so much time to listen to me talk. Um, I'd be happy to record a part two if there's specific questions. Um, and if there is something that I did not answer that you were really hoping that I would, but I hope that I answered much of what you were hoping to hear. It's good to be back. I'll be easing myself back into the workspace soon um, as we figure out the next step of our journey is my journey as a mom and a business owner. It's, it's a crazy one, but it's beautiful and you guys make it all worth it. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for listening while I've recorded this podcast today. Um, We've had like 14,000 interruptions, so hopefully it seamlessly fits all together. Um, I don't have any child care at this moment, but my cousin stepped in this afternoon so I could finish this on time. Shout out to her. And I'm just so happy to be here and share this. And I hope, again, it helps one person out there feel less alone in their emotions. And again, the last thing I want to stress is please, please allow help. Please let that help in and please know whatever you're feeling, you're not alone. I love you. Guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of What the Actual Fork Pod. We know there are a lot of pods out there and we are so grateful that you are here listening with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, share with all your friends and faves and follow along with us on social at what the actual fork pod we promise to continue to bring you the hottest topics greatest guests and the most fun you can possibly have while fighting diet culture bullshit we love you we appreciate you and we will see you next week for a lot more fun